Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. Just a quick note, um, I did a survey for everyone asking whether this video should be given an age, rest age restriction by me because it features monster boobs, basically female monster nipples. Wild harpies generally don't bother wearing much clothing and the artwork often reflects that so fair warning if you are of the young persuasion uh, this video is not age restricted. Um, I'm not restricting the content in any way. The harpies are classic Greek mythology monsters in the form of a half woman, half bird, flesh eating, sadistic, spiteful and manipulative magical creatures with a hauntingly alluring song. You should already know this and know what you're going to see in the images. They have a fairly diverse history in the game dating back to the first supplement for the original edition. They have appeared in every edition thus far because they are instantly recognisable well-known monsters. However, there has been a small but significant changes to the lore in Dungeons and Dragons for their appearance and behaviour of the Harpy over these last four decades, not the least of which is the rather big changes imposed on them for the current edition, and I have a lot more to say on that in just a moment. Harpies have also been offered as a player character race. Uh, the first time was way back in 1989 for D&D Basic, then in 2003 for 3rd edition Savage Species, and I dare say they will show up as a playable race for 5th edition at some point officially maybe. There may very well be something that is for sale on the DMs Guild you can include in your campaign, and I know from the survey that some people are playing uh, characters as harpies at the moment. My general attitude is that any creature with intelligence comparable to one of the civilized races uh, should have at least a chance of one of them being outlandishly good compared to the usual. They are the outcasts who can't stand the evil ways of the uh, their other members of their species live. So basically from our point of view they would be misanthropes, psychopaths from their point of view. So it's possible to have a player character who is a harpy and not a horrible monster. Most people will have familiarity with other harpies uh, and know them as, well, they'll have a great deal of difficulty dealing with one that shows up in their town one day, acting all non-murdery, and at best, at absolute best, they will be okay with it as long as someone has their eye on their harpy player character at all times, because they will always suspect it is all some sort of elaborate ruse, and any minute the harpy is going to start brutally torturing and killing something or someone. Even the most accepting and kind-hearted old granny is not going to leave a harpy alone with her favourite cat. I mean, have you seen the way the harpy looks at her fluffy wompkins? It may as well be walking around basted in butter with salt and pepper seasoning. People will flinch when the harpy cleric lays their taloned hands on them to heal their wounds, and they will want to wash themselves afterwards. I know this sounds like horrible behaviour, but this is just people who have spent their entire lives and have a culture where people have seen what harpies do to their victims. They've seen people who have been eaten to death. They have lost livestock, pets, friends, their own children, especially children, to these terrible creatures. To them, there is absolutely nothing good that comes from letting a harpy live. They live in a world with stark, brutal divisions between life, death, good and evil. And harpies are evil. They've gone their whole lives knowing this to be the absolute truth. Even the most accepting community may be very slow to step in and stop a member of their own kind taking out their grief, anger and hatred on that good aligned harpy in their midst if that person just lost an entire family tortured to death by other evil harpies. Only those whom the harpy character has formed true bonds of friendship with would think to risk themselves in any way to save the life of any harpy. They are just that nasty normally. But why are they so horrible? Well, the Greeks and Romans believed they represented the storm winds. At first they thought of them as nice creatures, messengers of the gods. Zeus um, had them bring them to the Arrhenes. Uh, they raced across the sky, but they came to be regarded as monsters, and those winds became the gales that hurl branches through windows and tear the roof off your house. One of the earliest depictions of them is from the Greek writer Aeschylus, um, who said they are wingless in appearance, black, altogether disgusting. They snore with a repulsive breath. They drip from their eyes hateful drops. Their attire is not fit to bring either before the statues of the gods or into the homes of men. I have never seen the tribe that produced this company, nor the land that boasts of rearing this brood with impunity and does not grieve for its labours afterwards. So they are very bad news for the locals. They are horrible and they don't seem to reproduce like normal creatures do. Also, in that depiction, they don't have wings. Let's 
have a look first at the Monster Ecology articles written about the harpy in Dragon Number 115 by Ed Greenwood. Just a brief overview. First thing to note here is that Al Minster, the sage of Shadowdale, states that harps, as he calls them, are sirens. The harpy and the siren are one and the same, which is why we don't see a listing for the siren in the monster manual. Also, Elminster confirms that harpies concentrate their alluring song on one target at a time, which requires some concentration on their part. So the effect probably has a psychic component to it um, that stops as soon as the singing harpy is incapacitated or fails to spend its bonus action to continue. Originally, Harpy Song had a cumulative, debilitating effect on a character's ability to make a saving throw against it, including some conditional influence, um, influences such as having heard the call of a Harpy uh, and failed the saving throw sometime before in the previous year. If the character was sleeping when they heard it and they had to make a saving throw, or if the character had previously been warned about the effects of the song, um, they would get a bonus to it. Bards, understandably... Also, they all know about the Harpy harpy Song. For a class that dedicates itself to the use of magical music, Harpy Song is 101, required lesson. So originally, bards had special protection against the song, and you're free to include that boon for them if you want. Give the bard and the party advantage on saving throws against Harpy Song. Give them a chance to shine and save the day. The difficulty class for the saving throw in 5th edition is only 11 though, and those who make the saving throw cannot be further influenced by it for a full 24 hours, so it's really weak, even for a challenge rating 1 monster. This is an effect that requires a character to make a terrible dice roll, or a player to make a terrible dice roll for it to have any effect on the character other than just adding to the atmosphere of the encounter. So here is something that you can do to include as a dungeon master to compensate for that low, low difficulty class. It is DC 11 for player characters, yes. But Elminster also states that harpies can charm monsters merely by laying their hands on a creature and willing them to obey the harpy, which actually ties in really well with their new background, original lore of the harpy for 5th edition. So let's have a look at that. I may may certainly be wrong, but this seems to have Jeremy Crawford's um, elven agenda written all over it. However, something has been edited out of this tale, and it really suffers as a result. And when you read into the history of the the characters involved in things in the story, it really it's a glaring omission. So let's uh, let me fill in the details for you. The story goes, and this is deeply nerdy. <laughs> the story goes at some point in the distant past, which would be tens of thousands of years before the fall of the Elven civilization on Toril. Or, hey, perhaps this occurred somewhere else. We'll find out. I have some ideas on that, um, so we'll get to that in a second. An elf wandering a forest heard birdsong so pure and wholesome that she was moved to tears. Following the music, she came upon a clearing where stood a handsome elf youth who had also paused to hear the bird song. This was Fenmaril Mesterin, a reclusive elf god. His divine presence stole her heart, and as he fled, vanishing into the woods, Um, it was like he was never there. Okay, so let's pause the tale there and fill in the details of exactly who Fenmarel Mysterine actually is and how this may have occurred in a demiplane of limbo. See, Fenmarel is a member of the Seldarine, meaning the Fellowship of Brothers and Sisters of the Wood, or the Elven Pantheon of what passes for gods in their culture, which is large. I think there's over 30 gods. Uh, Though Fenrel refuses to have any contact with the rest of the Seldrin unless absolutely necessary, he is notoriously sullen and withdrawn, offering cynicism and distrust to any non-elf he encounters. Basically, he's the lesser god of outcasts, scapegoats, and isolation, so this uh, elven woman could not have picked a worse choice in potential boyfriend. But Fenrel is like the ultimate moody elven heartthrob, rebel without a cause sexy bad boy i have no doubt in my mind that he wears a leather jacket and his clergy are essentially elven emos they all have different ceremonies from based on what they feel is best they pray it to him at dusk representing the darkness that settled on the world you know nobody understands their pain they are obsessed with their constant and terrible ennui Uh, one thing in their favor though is they're known to be experts at deception poisoning and guerrilla warfare which elves generally find distasteful but with their very low population these days they've come to rely on those sorts of methods more and more. Fenrir Mysterine was Lolth's adulterous partner prior to her betrayal of Corellian uh, Larathian. He was among the first to be seduced by her promises of power but managed to get back on track with the rest of the Seldarine before the betrayal became anything serious. He thinks that Corellian is going to punish him for it at some point and will only ever 
gather with the rest of the Seldrine if Sahinine Moonbow is there, because he basically has the hots for her so badly it overrides his paranoia and social anxiety. So when he was caught listening to the incredible bird song that was beyond amazing, he predictably cut and ran. No other elven maiden could interest he who was a lover of Lolf before her fall, and he stood in the and who has stood in the intoxicating presence of Sahinine. So he was out of there. Though the elf woman searched the woods and called for her stranger, she found no sign of his passage. Driven to despair by her longing, she begged the gods to help her. Now, in steps Airdrie Fania, intermediate god, elven goddess of the wind, weather, and most importantly, and why did they not mention this in the manual, she is the goddess of the Avariel. She's even called the queen of the Avariel, the winged elves who seem to have just been swept under the rug for 5th edition. So the Queen of the Avariel hears the elf's cries and moves to her aid. She appeared as the bird whose song had entranced the outcast god, then taught the song of beauty and seduction to the elf woman. Erdrifania is notoriously free and chaotic. She rarely stays in any place for very long and delights in causing unpredictable mayhem, including creating random storms just so she can enjoy soaring through crackling thunderhead clouds. Like Fenmeril, she seldom involves herself with the rest of the Seldrine. Most of her worshippers these days are Arakokra anyway. So she spends a lot of time hanging out with the uh, the Jinn of Zakara on Toril, which is a land seldom talked about in lore videos, so I should probably go exploring there soon, if Mr. Rex or Jordan doesn't beat me to it. She also pays a lot of attention to uh, the Citadel of Ice and Steel, which is the center of genie activity within the elemental plane of air. An amazing edifice. It's a gigantic chunk of ice and earth, smoothed by the elemental winds into the shape of a nearly perfect oval. Anyway, in this instance, Airdrie heard the prayers of this elf woman. Well, I submit to you that this was not a regular elf. This was an avarial, a winged elf, which makes what happened next in the story make a hell of a lot more sense. So Airdrie teaches her avarial follower the song that most that's the most beautiful song to sing ever. And when the avarial singing failed to draw Fenmeril Mysterine to her side, she went ballistic and hurled abuse and curses at the Seldarine, renouncing all that is good and kind, working dreadful and profane magic to transform herself into a personification of vengeance and hate. And thus, the first harpy was effectively created, by itself. The transformation worked its magic on the winged elf spirit as well as her body, turning her desire for love into the hunger for flesh, and even as her bird song, uh, beautiful song continued to draw creatures to her deadly embrace. The English playwright and poet William Congreve wrote these lines in his play The Morning Bride in 1697. Heaven hath, has no rage like love hatred turned, like hell a fury like a woman scorned. Uh, back in those times, scorned had more specific meaning. In 17th century, a scorned woman was one who had been betrayed in love, especially one who had been replaced by a rival. And when Avariel learns that her rival is Sayanin Moonbow, well, uh, if she can't win by fair means, she'll win by foul, if you'll pardon the pun. Harpies are infused with an evil intent, a hateful destruction. Torture and spite are hardwired into them. They particularly detest males. As a result of this, they tend to murder any offspring that appeared overly male, which has resulted in a species that, to outward appearances, looks to be nothing but females, when in actual fact, there are male harpies, they just look exactly the same as the females, thanks to a malicious form of selective breeding. An interesting counterpoint to the question of female dwarves growing beards, I think. Harpies also mature sexually extremely quickly. They are fully adult and able to reproduce at just two years of age, which is just unheard of for an elf. They lay eggs up to 20 in a nest, but no more than a few of the offspring will ever survive, as both they and their parent kill off the rest. Harpies are terrible parents. The young are basically little more than animals left to fend for themselves as soon as they leave the nest and devoured the rest of their siblings. And that's quite a start to life, having to eat your dead brothers and sisters because your parent won't share food with you once you're weaned, which happens very soon thanks to growing a set of fangs and a rampant craving for raw uh, meat. So it is safe to say that all harpies know exactly what baby harpies taste like, and they would rather eat some other species of humanoid, particularly some lovely elf meat. But they will settle for tough and chewy dwarf meat if they have to, and goblin meat if they're desperately hungry. Going by the legends of their origin, 
they may very well have spread from the forest realm within the plane of limbo to other worlds and planes of existence, and their bizarre breeding selection process has resulted in a dizzying array of wildly different looking harpy subspecies. Some are quite devolved, brutish and depraved, others are almost as intelligent and as capable as Navarial, able to use bows and fashion clothing for themselves. Those depicted in the monster manual are sort of in the middle. They are intelligent but not smart, they can use weapons but it is a club, not a bow. They are all like all harpies. They collect baubles and trinkets from their um, slain foes. They'll squabble and fight over particularly nice ones, but then leave them in their nest to moulder underneath lots of rotting carcasses. But you can find magical items if you go searching through their nests. Just look out for the desperately hungry uh, baby harf- harpies. Looking at their stats, they have a natural armor class of 11, which is basically just naked with a slight dexterity bonus. They have 78 plus 7 or between 14 and 63 hit points with an average of 38. It says that they can only speak common, which would mean they've retained no vestiges of their elven heritage at all. They are highly mobile and prefer to take advantage of terrain where their flight gives them maximum advantage, so rocky coastlines and really noxious swamps and bogs are where you find them, but also among the broken ruins and spires of Ravnica, particularly the Rubble Belt. They use their alluring song most famously on passing ships combining their effect to draw ships into jagged and wave-tossed rocks, where they can then pick off the drowning sailors as they spill from their wrecked vessels. The manual says that to hear a harpy song is to hear music more beautiful than anything else in the world. A traveller that succumbs to this entrancing effect of that singing is compelled to blunder towards its source. A harpy sometimes charms a victim before it attacks, but a more effective use of the song is to lure prey over cliffs, into bogs and into quicksand or deadly pits. Creatures trapped or incapacitated then become easy targets for the harpy's wrath. The wrath may take the form of rocks, dropped onto the target from above if the harpy suspects anything like it, a fair fight it can take place. They are sadistic, but they're also cowards and will abandon a fresh uh, meal of meat if the prey is too dangerous for them to easily overcome. They prefer to have an incapacitated, helpless victim so that they can slowly torture them to death, preferring to eat their prey while it's still alive. They can use a club and their wicked talons to attack someone in, com- in the, combat, uh, the same combat round, they are both plus 3 to hit. The club does 1d4 plus 1 bludgeoning damage, but the claws do 2d4 plus 1 slashing damage, which is more than sufficient to inflict an eviscerating wound that will spill a character's guts out and hurt a lot. Harpies will also make flyby attacks if the characters happen to be disadvantaged by difficult terrain and if they're climbing up rock faces or over slippery kelp-covered and wave-tossed rocks on the shore. The slashing wounds to the face, the scalp, the upper back will make for some messy, heavily bleeding wounds and the harpies strike to disfigure people. So they'll put out eyes, they'll tear off noses by preference. The Song of the Harpy works not just on those player characters, but also all manner of other creatures as mentioned. In past edition, harpies could also charm monsters. So you could enrich your encounters by giving them uh, large flocks of very aggressive seabirds um, or swamp birds pestering the characters. They might include some very aggressive sea lions and seals. So the seabirds make the climb up the cliff face difficult to give disadvantage to the characters. The harpies are attacking from above, slashing at their backs and the back of their legs. The harpies um, then let them fall off the cliff and land amongst a bunch of vicious sea lions who proceed to bite the heck out of them. The harpies might ride on charmed orca, or have some pet sharks. They might drop poisonous snakes down onto the characters as they try to traverse dense, dense swamp, marsh, or precarious cliffs. Or, of course, uh, giant crabs are always a fan favourite. I hope that helps to clarify the 5th edition legend of the Harpy's origin somewhat. Bit of a bonus elven pantheon lore thrown in there for good measure. Obviously, this is not a legend that elves would be happy talking about to anyone, particularly non-elves, so it might not be widely known in the D&D world. I'll leave it up to you, as always. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.